commercials no subscriptions no network no rules and at the end of the day my friends no comparison welcome back to another edition of boa the revival very excited about tonight's show we've got a really cool guest for you and uh an awesome awesome topic uh our guest is alex matsuo and we're gonna be talking about her book women of the paranormal and even though we're only using the audio i like to do this with the guest just to prove my my guilty conscience from high school i did read the book you can even see the notes up in here uh women of the paranormal volume one a brief history absolutely fantastic uh i use this compliment sparingly on the show but it is an absolute tour de force it is fantastic it is really really good stuff and it's like i've been in this field for almost 20 years now and i learned so much from reading this book uh i was absolutely blown away and enlightened after i had finished the book and and so uh, I absolutely loved it. I highly recommend it to all the Banal of America listeners. Um, it is fantastic. It belongs in the library of all serious students of the paranormal. And to give you a little background on Alex, uh, where do I have my notes here? Alex, she's a paranormal researcher, singer, and author. And she's the founder of the Association of Paranormal Study and runs the blog and YouTube channel, The Spooky Stuff. And in addition to Women of the Paranormal, Volume 1, A Brief History, She's also the author of One Bed Over, A Hospital Haunting, The Brave Mortal's Guide to Ghost Hunting, The Haunting of the 10th Avenue Theater, More Than Ghosts, A Guide to Working at Residential Cases in the Paranormal, and The Haunted Actor, um, and possibly even more. But that was what I found uh, online. So, <laughs> And you can find out more from her at alexmatsuo.com. Alex, of course, you can spell that. M-A-T-S-U-O dot com. So there's all the information. And Women of the Paranormal, we can get it on Amazon. So pick it up, folks. You're going to want to get it after you hear this conversation because uh, I'm already beyond excited about talking about it. So welcome to the show, Alex. It's really a great treat to get you on here and to talk about this awesome, awesome book. Yeah, Tim, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm already having a blast, you know, just hearing you do the <laughs> intro. <laughs> Well, I'm at every word I said. I really, I really love the book. And and uh, for folks who are wondering, like, well, well, obviously it's uh, Women in the Paranormal. One part of one aspect of the book that I really loved a lot is it's sort of these. The, there's 38 women, I believe, uh, profiled in the book, and they're these sort of nice little. I don't want to say bite size, but sort of little chapters of each a biography, a little mini biography of, of each of these pioneering women and their contri- contributions to the field and their background and their life story in a way um, and their legacy. And it's like, it's just a great fun book for reading. If I was a teacher, uh, and I, I think I might've been in a different life. My mother was a teacher, a lifelong teacher, but I, this is the kind of book, if I was a teacher, I, this is the kind of thing that I would have in my classroom and be like, here, you take this chapter, you take that chapter, like, and each of you come back with a, you know, a paper on it or whatever. It's, it was, it's just tremendous, uh, just tremendous, tremendous stuff. I really enjoyed it. So, you know, we start out each sort of new time, a guest is on the show with the bio, the background, you know, who is Alex Matsuo? How did you get mixed up in all this stuff? Ah, uh, yes, the origin story. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I had experiences when I was a kid. So after my grandfather died, uh, I want to say about a year or two after that event happened, I had my first experience. And then I would have, like, little pockets of experience. I like to call them pockets of experiences because then I would have, like, almost like a month of, like, experiences. And then it would just kind of stop and then oh, it would weird. come back again. Sometimes it would happen in a theater. Sometimes it was a creepy, oogie creature, like, in my bedroom or, oh, wow. yeah. Um, but it wasn't enough to, like, I guess, actively pursue. But I was also a kid at the time. The big catalyst was after I was in a really bad car accident on New Year's Eve of 2005. Um, I had to go to the hospital. It was a really, really bad accident. I 
ended up with a vertically sheared pelvis, three broken vertebrae, a shattered tailbone. Oh like it was a bad accident. Um, when I was in the trauma room, I had what I could only explain as maybe an out of body experience. I don't think it was a near death experience because I didn't have like the classic near death experience signs. Right. Like I didn't see a light. I could get up and walk around. I could see my mom and my friends in the hospital lobby. Um, but there was another person in the room in the trauma room with me because New Year's Eve 2005, there was a lot of accidents happening that night. Plus, it was oh, okay. raining in San Diego, California, and San Diegans, we can't drive. We freak out, you know, uh, when it rains. So the hospitals <laughs> were packed full. In fact, the ambulance couldn't even take me to the nearest hospital because it was already full. Oh, wow. um, so we were sharing trauma rooms, and uh, when I was having my out-of-body experience, the other guy in the room was also having oh, what wow. could have been an out-of-body experience. Um I survived that night. He did not, and um, he ended up attaching himself to me. Oh God! And it lasted for about eight months. Oh, um, wow. And during that time, and at this point, it was 2006. The paranormal community back then did not really exist. Um, the, not what we have now. Like today, if I was dealing with a spirit attachment, I could probably put a post on Facebook, and three, right, three, right. ten, twenty teams would reach out to me saying, "Hey, yeah, we'll help." Back in 2006, mm -mm, not so much, um, especially when you're in a very conservative Christian household with an equally conservative Christian social circle. So, you know, it's like one of those things like you didn't talk about it really because you didn't right. want to be judged. You know, you talk to your pastor about getting help and the pastor's like, I'm not touching that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We ended up getting help from the Greek Orthodox Church because uh, they were like, oh, yeah, we'll come. We'll come check it out. We'll come help. Um more so put a muzzle on it than actually solving it. But at the end, it's the most anticlimactic ending, um, mainly because what resolved it was just showing empathy to this guy and saying things like, because the big thing he would say to me when he appeared would be, why you, not me? Why you, oh, not God. me? Oh, God. That would be even more haunting. That, yeah, a little that would... bit, right? Uh, he yeah. was really having a hard time processing his death. Yeah. Um, and eventually what ultimately ended all of it was me just empathizing with him saying, like, I'm sorry this happened to you. I'm sorry this is the situation, but we can't fix it. We can't do anything about it. It is what it is. You, we can either keep doing this and drive each other crazy or you can move on and I can move on. Um, yeah, and that's what ultimately solved it. I mean, he, I, I, I ended up seeing him a couple more times after that, but it was not nearly as bad as it was when he was constantly around. But experiencing that and experiencing the lack of support and the lack of help was what inspired me to do to get more into this. And yeah. um, about five years later, after I was done with grad school, I started the Association of Paranormal Study. Um, specializing in residential cases, businesses, um, and just also just being a resource to the community. Um, we've evolved and changed a little bit over the last almost uh, 13 years now. Like, we don't really do a lot of residential cases anymore, mainly yeah. because, like, the climate has changed in the paranormal, like, and, and people who have experienced hauntings. I mean, social media has a bit of, has has d been a big factor with those changes. Um, it's it's it started to get hard to differentiate between like, okay, you want to go on TikTok live while we do this, and why? Right. You yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Content so it, creators, it, yeah. it it changed. It changed quite a bit, and we'll take cases on a case by case basis. But what we do now is we do a we have a very heavy vetting system, so we'll usually have them fill out a case form. And then we do like a consult on Zoom or Google Meet and just say like, hey, you know, tell us a little bit more about what's going on. Um, usually the consult is enough for them to eat, to decide to either not work with us or try the resolutions that we suggested and it's fine. So, yeah. you know, so it's changed a bit. So we've, we've pivoted more to be more research heavy, um, acad I don't want to say academic, but, you know, feel, writing articles and we're hosting our very first paranormal conference this um, this summer in Gettysburg, and yeah, on yeah. August Saturday, August seventeenth, we're doing the paranormal research symposium. Um, so, and and I'm also trying to figure out like how can APS exist nationwide where 
because I, I travel a lot for my job. Right. Um, so it's like, how can this team keep going if I'm in London for a week, for a week, or right, right. if I have to move to Seattle, like how can this group keep going? Right. Um, so I had to like, think like bigger picture of the team, but yeah, I mean that, but yeah, that, it, that car accident, the attachment that happened after that was a big factor in who I am today. I can imagine. So when this spirit was attached to you, so he was kind of, I hate to like it. Was it like ghost? Was it like with, with how the guy kept coming, uh, you know, how Patrick Swayze kept coming and kind of bothering to be more and stuff? I mean, um, Whoopi Goldberg, kind of? That's yeah, kind of what I'm imagining. Like that. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of how he was. I mean, he didn't really have like a glow about him. It was just more like he was as real as, you know, you sitting here right now, um, yeah, except yeah. some. And, and actually, he, the way he presented himself changed depending on like, his mood. So if like he, if he was being really aggressive that day, he was more like, I'm pretty sure he was a biker cause he was wearing all leather. And oh, um, I, I did see his, I did see him next to me when I was still conscious and his, his outfit was torn to ribbons. Um, oh, so I geez. think there was like some asphalt skidding that happened right. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he would appear more bloody and injured. Oh, um, but oh. then other times he would be like, just very clean. He would be clean, yeah. like hair combed, clean. And, and that was when he was like more so neutral. Um, never, he wasn't really ever in a good mood or well, yeah, I yeah. never really saw anything positive with him, but he, he had his neutral. Then he had his like pissed off phase. Interesting. So, yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. That's yeah. And can and, and after that, have I been able to see any sort of ghosts or spirits like that since? Nah. <laughs> so, I was the chosen one for him apparently because but I, I but I've also been I've been told by several mediums that that experience traumatized me so much that I built a wall to ever right seeing interesting which, that's yeah. fair <laughs> yeah and I could also see like we don't understand how this all works so I could all, mm -hmm. almost see like if you guys both sort of burst out into the ether at the same mm -hmm. time like I could see how somehow there would be some kind of like he gets stuck onto you almost you know yeah like, i think that's, and that, and that's the other like thing happened. yeah and the only other time i have been able to see something was i always joke that there has to be like a full moon the plants have to be perfectly aligned <laughs> and a moonbeam has to hit the third leaf off of the fifth tree in the in the appalachian mountains like i make that right. kind of joke of like for me to ever really see anything um i went ghost hunting after i found out that a very dear family member passed away um, but there was really nothing I could do about it at that moment. And plus I had already paid for the investigation. So I was like, yeah, I'll just go <laughs> ahead and go. Um, I should not have gone, uh, cause I was an emotional mess the entire time, but I did see a gentleman in this building we were investigating and I could see him clear as day, just like the man in the leather jacket and the biker outfit. Right. Um, and I was like, this is something I have not experienced since 2006. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Um, but that was me being in a very vulnerable state, um, grieving. Uh, I was exhausted. Like I had been up all night the, the night before and I didn't sleep during the day. And then I was out investigating in Gettysburg of all places. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's the only other time that, that but that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's a fascinating origin story. That's really a lot of guests are like, I watched Unsolved Mysteries as a kid, and here I am. So it's like, oh, well, okay. Me, me too. <laughs> me too. Well, here's the thing. I loved Unsolved Mysteries. I loved Are You Afraid of the Dark. Now, this was before the car accident. My mom was very anti-paranormal. Like, oh, okay, yeah. I basically watched Are You Afraid of the Dark in my grandmother's bedroom because um, we lived with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so I basically went to her room to watch Unsolved Mysteries, Are You Afraid of the Dark, Um Scary school, scary stories to tell in the dark. That book, I had to leave it at school because I could, or I, oh, it would wow. have to be like in my. If I put it in my backpack, it had to be like in my math book or something. Right, like right. I was hiding porn. Um, yeah. <laughs> my mom was very anti, like divination, ghosts, um, anything new age. Because again, conservative Christian. Um, and then ironically, when she died and I was going through her stuff, um, I found all of these pendulums, dowsing rods, tarot cards, oh, wow. books on how to read tarot cards. And I'm like, this woman? <laughs> <laughs> wow. This woman? Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So.
So you, so you, you, you know, you start writing, you've written all these books. This is, I believe this is like your most recent one. Now this is how did, I mean, I can kind of understand the inspiration for this book, but what made you decide to write this book? You kind of explain in the book, but you know, it's a podcast. So (laughs) yeah. Oh no, that's fine. It's fine. Um, Yeah. So a couple things Um, I had, so I ran into Catherine Crow's name several years ago. Actually, right after I, I founded my team, I had done a presentation on poltergeist, on like the origin of poltergeist, and I ran into Catherine Crow's name. Um, I didn't really think anything of it, though, because at the time I didn't realize how marginalized women were in the para, paranormal field, in the parapsychology right. field. I didn't think anything of it. And then it wasn't until I want to say several years ago where – there, there was a diverse period in paranormal TV for a little bit with Paranormal State. That was like probably the most diverse show. Yeah. Which, again, when you see that presence there, you're like, oh, yeah, it's all good. But then, like, I don't know, something in the climate changed with paranormal entertainment, and it became very heavy towards men, um, especially, like, white men. Yeah, um, yeah. And anytime yeah. there was a woman in a show, she's either like the the psychic, the historian, the witch. She wasn't necessarily at the forefront. And I started having conversations with colleagues in the community about it. And um, Catherine Crow popped up again uh, from my friend Amanda Woomer. And I'm like, oh, I know that name. And realizing like, oh, wait, Catherine Crow was one of the first women t- or one of the first people to – do an investigation like we do today that's wild and amanda sometimes posts this meme that's like hey just a reminder the first ghost hunter was Catherine crow and the backlash that she gets is incredible she actually got banned from a haunted location for posting that um and i posted it too and i got a lot of backlash and i got like well what about the priest that would exercise ghosts or exercise demons with whips and i'm like okay but that's not a paranormal investigation that's an right exercise. yeah you know there's a difference um and so i just found there's a lot of these people just trying to discount this the contributions by this woman yeah and so that was kind of like my first inkling of okay if a lot of people don't know who Catherine Crow is, you know, but who is it made me think like who else is out there that we don't know about. Right. Right. Um, and I, I started off with 12 women. It was actually going to be a blog series. Um, and then I just kept finding names and more names and finding like, Holy cow, this woman was alive at the same time as Charles Dickens or alive at the same time as Aleister Crowley, but we never heard of her. Yeah. Um, or, oh my gosh, this woman ran the parapsychology unit at UCLA and assisted with the Doris Bith- Bither case that created the Entity movie, but we don't know who Thelma Moss is? Wait, what? So it was one of those like, holy cow. And I ended up with a list of about 100 women. Oh, wow. And... I was like, okay, there's no way I can put a hundred women in this book, at least not for this volume, because right, I was right. and I'm and I was still trying to figure out exactly what is it going to be, because yeah. um, I did I wanted it to be a little bit more than a who's who mm-hmm. list, but I didn't want it to be like a biography, like an extensive biography of every woman. Yeah. Um, I did have a hard time choosing though, which is why there's 38 women in the book and not like a clean number like 30 or 35. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so I may, I think volume two may even it out a little bit with, um, I I'm thinking 42 just to kind of, just kind of poke fun of myself oh, too, like go, 42. Yeah. So then that way it will be 80. And yeah. then in my research, I have, I think my list for volume three is at 50 right now. So wow. yeah, it's, uh, I keep finding, so I'm thinking it's probably going to reach at least four volumes. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's going to be about four volumes total, I I think. Um, and, and, of course, every time I find one woman, it kind of branches off into yeah, more. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I should look her up and see. And then I'm like, okay, she's going on the list, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, you. so you've mentioned uh, Catherine Crow a few times here now. So give people sort of a little thumbnail uh, for the people who are listening. Uh, because I, I – this is – a lot of this is uh, – paranormal sort of ghostly stuff and, and parapsychology and, and sort of, um, for lack of a better term, sort of like psychic uh, ability type stuff. There's a little outside of my wheelhouse. So I, that's how I learned a lot of 
stuff uh, in the book. I'm primarily like UFOs and, and Bigfoot and kind of crypto stuff. So, um, and, and sort of my weakest area would be the ghostly, the ghost stuff and paranormal. So, um, so personally, I was like fascinated because I have really never dug into just in general the history of sort of trying to decipher the ghost thing because I kind of noticed a through line in the book in general that was like, okay, first we're just going to, the people were just like, first we're just going to talk about these ghosts. First we're just going to collect these ghost stories. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like the, the very beginning. And it was like, all right, these, these things are happening. Let's just treat, you know, let's just document these things that are happening that, you know, yep. have been in, in fiction before, but these are real stories from real people. And then it was like, all right, let's try and figure out what's happening here. And then it became like, let's try and communicate with them. And now we're, you know, it kind of evolves. It was that, I kind of under, got a better understanding of the evolution of of this field of study, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. through your book. So I really appreciated it in that way because I never really give it much thought. I was like, all right, how did that? So, but let's talk about Catherine Crow. As you said, she she did the first uh, paranormal investigation, if you will, ghost hunter, for lack of a better term. Yeah, so she was the one who at least documented. It's she's the first documented woman person to have done a, a paranormal investigation as we would know one today. Right. Um. So she had already done. Well, she was first and foremost. She was an author. Um. She was also a researcher. Um. You know, she had married young. She was in an abusive marriage. Left her husband. Took her kid with her. Made it to Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, she made a living independently as a writer, um, and actually her books had a female protagonist in it. She wrote plays also with female protagonists, so she was already like pretty forward-thinking for the early 19th century. Yeah. Um, so she did some translation work for um, for uh, for a biography of Frederica uh, Fred, Frederica Hoff. Um, who was known as a German, it was the Sears de Provost. Um, she translated that book by a German physician by the name of Justinus Kerner. Um, so Frederica Hoff would go into convulsions and trances, and these were so bad that she was bedridden. And it seemed that that was um, kind of the big inspiration for her, Um and then she went on to, because, so this was also a German story. Mm-hmm. And so Catherine started to do more research into the supernatural, the unknown. And, um, and that's where her, her her book, the groundbreaking book, that is the reason why we're here today, is The Night Side of Nature. Right. And in that book, she, one, she introduces um, doppelganger, the word doppelganger, and poltergeist into English usage. Mm-hmm. Um So she's the reason why we have these words. Um, And what's important to note, too, is that the book came out in 1848, which was the same year that the spiritualism movement started. However, spiritualism didn't hit the United Kingdom until about 1849. So Night Side of Nature was written without any sort of spiritualism influence. Um, But it did help spark the spiritualism movement in England. Um, so in this book, she – so in The Night Side of Nature, she gathered stories from people. So they were either sharing it directly with her. Um, she asked people to write her with their own ghost stories. Um, she looked into newspapers and as well as legends. And um, she was describing phenomenon that we would now call like out-of-body experiences, crisis apparitions, yeah, yeah. ESP apparitions, rates, time slips, um, near-death experiences – um, and this book was a huge hit. I mean, I want to say, like, I think it went through 16 different print editions. Like, oh, that, wow. it was a huge hit. Um, and I think the timing also worked out in her favor, too, because, you know, spiritualism was also becoming, like, the hot, the hot thing. Um, so after she put out Night Side of Nature, obviously more and more people were writing her. You know, it's yeah, like, hey, yeah, yeah. I've had this experience too. And she got a tip from uh, a man who his name was – she referred to him ha- as McN. Um, so McN's family owned a home in Edinburgh, and they couldn't keep tenants there. Um, tenants keep 
kept leaving. Uh, McEnn's family even priced the house so low, like nobody could like resist it, but people still wouldn't stay. <laughs> Penance kept leaving. And it turned out that the house was reported to be haunted. So about um, six or seven years later, um, she was talking about this haunted house to several gentlemen, and then they decided that they wanted to visit in the house. So she she wanted to visit. They wanted to visit the house. So she got in touch with McEn, who had the keys. House was vacant. Um, Catherine got her friend to come, and her friend was a clairvoyant. Now, what was interesting? Something interesting that Catherine did. She did not tell her friend, the clairvoyant, that the place was haunted. Instead, right. she told her friend, like, hey, I'm interested in buying this house, and I want to know what you think about it. So how often do paranormal investigators today, it's like, you know, you don't really tell the mediums exactly. what's going yeah, on. Yeah. You know, you let them, like, pick it pick up, pick it up on their own. Um, so they arrived around 11 p.m. So there was two men, um, a woman, the clairvoyant, and then, of course, Catherine. And they met Nick N. across the street from the house. They talked to a police officer so that the cops knew that they had permission to be at the house something else that we do as paranormal investigators <laughs> um and then uh yeah so when it came to the clairvoyance um yeah Catherine didn't tell her uh Catherine didn't tell her why they were there um and <laughs> it was just it was just really interesting uh how that whole process worked. So basically yeah. the clairvoyant um, did a reading through hypnosis. Um, they started to experience, hear some weird sounds. And then, um, so they started to, like, and, and uh, the medium started to see white lights, but no one else could see them. And then the clairvoyant suggested to Catherine that, you know, take, um, take her hand so when the clairvoyant grabbed Catherine's hand Catherine could actually see the white lights as well so it was almost like a skill transference almost yeah yeah uh which i thought was interesting um but Catherine didn't say anything because she was wondering if anyone else saw the light but anyway uh Catherine did say like hey the group didn't get great results but um but mcn came back uh she asked the rest of the group hey did you all see the light the group said no but then mcn said was it like a bright spark of light, like an oxy oxyhydrogen light? And Catherine's like, yes. And then McGann's like, oh, yeah, that's something that's, that happens a lot around here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's just, but that was very much like a modern paranormal investigation right, as we would yeah. see it today. Um, and there's nothing else like that documented. Um, and the foundation that Catherine set in that, that particular book um, – this book, the book that has the, the paranormal investigation, I think it's called Ghosts and Family Legends, off the top of my head, mm -hmm. um, Stories for Christmas. And uh, But that story and her research methodology and the process that she did actually helped set the foundation for the Society of Psychical Research. Yeah. So, which, that's, you know, no small feat right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's... Uh... Yeah, it's tremendous, and, and it's remarkable. She's actually probably one of the more well-known, I guess you could say, in the book, just because she's kind of like – there's been sort of a modern-day appreciation mm -hmm. uh, for for her contribution. It really is remarkable for people to – like, they hear this story. Remember, folks, this is like 1850 or whatever, like mm -hmm. sometime in the 1800s. It's uh, completely – it's a whole different world. So to be, but she's doing a pretty much modern day version of a paranormal investigation. Um, yep. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, we're going to go on chronological from the book. Cause I, cause that, that leads me to kind of want to bring up a, another player in the book. Uh, oh, great. Now there you go. All right. Uh, and that's uh, probably my favorite, chapter of the book is Rosina Despard. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, because it, it, it this the reason why I sort of pointed out to folks, you got to remember this is like uh, the 1850. Now, that Rosina was uh, operating in a different time, but uh, you may be able to tell me the years, but certainly before um, uh, before all this modern technology, but easily. And you point out in the book, she's staying at a house. I'm going to give a sort of brief thought. Staying at the house. They think there's a ghost. They're under the impression that there's some kind of spirit there. 
uh, woman in black uh, moving around. And at one point she goes out to the hall to uh, catch a glimpse of this, of this spirit and the candle goes out. And so then she's like, Oh, I'm pretty much shit out of luck here. Like I got to go back in the room because it's now pitch black. And that's like, it kind of reading the, I'm reading the book and I'm like, Oh, like it didn't kind of really dawn on me. It's like, like all this stuff is happening like uh, by candlelight. This is how how far back this is going on. So it's a really it, it just it really is remarkable when you think about it. Just uh, to put yourself in that kind of position, like imagine doing a ghost hunt under candlelight. It's like wow, that would be pretty. You got the you got to be pretty brave to be pulling off something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, gosh. <laughs> It's a whole different um it's a whole different ball game when you're in a house that's pretty much pitch black. I mean, this is pre electricity, right. so candlelight, that's it, then the candle goes out, like you see an apparition, a woman in black, and you go out to go chase her down and then the candle goes out, it's like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's my worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a little yeah. terrifying. Um, but yeah, the story of what's so cool about Rosina too is she ended up writing one of the most authoritative accounts of a haunting at, yeah. at, at, as a teenager, um, yeah. as a teenager of all ages, it wasn't like this, like an old, old man, like scientists, you know, documenting things. It was a teenager. And she was also very smart, like kind of wise beyond her years too. Um, because she was also try, you know, she was 19 when all of this started and, um, you know, she was documenting all of this through letters to her friend Catherine Campbell, who yes, may or may yeah. not have been a partner or a lover. Um, Catherine was not eager to surrender a lot of the letters to SPR, and it's alleged that yes. maybe some of those letters were a little spicy. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I remember that. You part know, book, I yeah. mean, it's gosh, there's a. I mean, I could write a whole other book about. SPR being a safe haven for the queer community. Maybe that'll be my next book. Um, <laughs> that's the whole thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, so Rosina was also trying to get into medical school at this time too. So not only is she dealing with this haunting and documenting it, she is studying. She is getting into medical school. Um, after the whole event, she actually went on to be to become a doctor, and then she became an assistant medical officer at a sanatorium, which was a, actually – it was a woman's prison. Um, but, yeah, it was just very interesting. And, and her family stayed at that house for quite some time after she left, and she right. was still able to document a few things. So, What I thought yeah. was interesting about her story um, is also that – it seemed like she spent a lot of time trying to – well, she, she researched, like, the house and tried to figure out who mm -hmm. the ghost could have been. And I thought it was interesting where it seemed like she kind of got – she probably sort of pinned down the identity of the ghost. And, yep. then, and then the hauntings kind of seemed to dissipate. And it was like, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's some connection there. Like, I wonder if, like, if you can – like once, if you figure out the ghost, if it kind of like gives them some kind of relief to to sort of like dissipate or move on to whatever, or or mm -hmm. just or just the they have no more, no longer have an effect on you, on the person. Where it's like, or I know you're, I know you're uh, Susan, or I know you're Bruce, or whatever, and it's like, come on, um, I'm not scared of you. You know, you have no effect on me anymore because I know your identity and everything. I don't know. It just kind of made me think. Like, I wonder if there's some. If there's something to that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like it's almost like the unknown thrives to and wants to stay unknown. Right. right. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, crap. She's finding more information about us. So it's time to fall back. <laughs> fall yeah, back. Exactly. Let's fall right. down. <laughs> right, right. I want, it makes me wonder. The other part, a little detail in that, just something about that story really provided a really interesting glimpse of that time period because the house kept changing names. That's what I loved too about the, the house that she was in. I mean, the house passed hands and then they would change the name of the house. Then it was like, then it became Cottonwood Manor. And then it's like, then this guy bought it. And then it became, you know, Silver Spring, uh, you know, I don't know, Silver Spring. So it's just like, mm -hmm. they just keep changing the name of the house. It's like, we don't name, we don't name houses enough anymore. That's, uh, 
you kind know, of my takeaway. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the, that that was kind of my thing too. I'm like, why don't we name houses anymore? I mean, actually, where I live, there are a couple of there's several houses um, that have names, but I think it's just because people are too rich up here. Right, well, right, not really yeah. rich, but I live in one of the most expensive areas of the country. So uh, when you get into the really bougie neighborhoods, it's yes, you, know, you, yeah, you start yeah. to run into property names, and a lot of them are like farms and stuff or wineries too. So it's like, ah, uh, okay. I, I live in the D.C. metro area. Gotcha. So. Yeah, yeah, Virginia area. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was like I said, that was one of my favorite stories because it really sort of it very felt very like a glimpse into her time period. Um, and so I move into a different one now. What I was really surprised by, um, and I think you point out in the book, this kind of didn't come to light until recently, was Helen Peters uh, Nosworthy, uh, who actually named the Ouija board. And it's like, yes, I. I you know, I mean, I think you credited Robert Roach for uncovering this. We had Robert on, I think, probably before he found out about this because we had him on a long time ago mm -hmm. um, talking about the history of the Ouija board. And I don't recall that ever coming up. You mentioned he, came, he kind of found this out sort of, uh, you know, no more than maybe 10 years ago or something. Um, so talk about someone who was lost to history literally until until just very recently and who had a, an enormous um, impact on, on popular culture. It's unbelievable. Huge, huge impact. Yeah. Helen was somebody that I hadn't found out about until I went to go to the, I went, I visited the Witchboard Museum in Salem, mm -hmm. who is run by John Koziak, I think is his last name, who's part of the Talking Board Historical Society. I already knew Merch. Like, I already knew Merch. Yeah. Um, we had talked quite a bit. I had him on my podcast to talk Ouija boards, and I actually started collecting Ouija boards. So, you know, obviously I wasn't talk to him especially if i found something i would just text it take a picture and text it and he would tell yeah, me yeah. like oh yeah i can i can tell what where this time period this is from um so i was at the witchboard museum and john koziak had the had a sketch of helen peters nosworthy on the wall and he was talking about her and i'm like hold up wait she did what now <laughs> she did what <laughs> um so when he told me that she was part of naming the Ouija board, I immediately like wrote her name on my hand and I was like, okay, I got to follow up with this. Um, but one of my favorite stories with this, with the naming of the board is, um, so Helen got married fairly late in life, especially for the time period. Um, she got married, I believe it was in her thirties and she actually married a guy who was a little younger than her. And I'm like, good for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so she, oh yeah, she was 39 and he was 27. So I was like, good for you. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good for you, Helen. <laughs> you know, good for you. Um, and ironically, he was the son of a spiritualist in Britain. So I thought that was interesting. Oh. But um, but the naming of the Ouija board. So Helen was an avid follower of a British um, feminist uh named um, Marie-Louise Rame, I think if I'm remembering that name correctly. You have to check the book to fact check me. Um, but she was also <laughs> known under a pen name of Ouida, O-U-I-D-A. Mm -hmm. And so women who supported Ouida would often wear a pendant with the name Ouida and her picture. And it's believed that Helen – and Helen wore a, a Ouida pendant. So – the story around that is the night the Ouija board was named, um, she she was using the board as well as Charles Kennard, and she asked, you know, what do you want the board to be named? And then it's spelled O-U-I-J-A. And right. after that, Helen went up to Kennard and been like, listen, I have this pendant on my around my neck with this. Are we sure about this? But Kennard was like, oh, this is amazing. And yeah, so <laughs> call it Ouija. So there's a possibility that the Ouija board name is an unintentional nod to one of the right. most prominent British feminists of the 19th century, um, which I love. Yeah, <laughs> I love it's that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but Helen did believe in the power of the board, too. She was a, a fairly strong medium, as she was described by her brother-in-law, Elijah Bond. And um, 
ironically, given the area where I live, I'm like, oh, Baltimore is just like less than an hour away. I can actually go to all these places. And they actually came to D.C. to the patent office to prove they had to prove the power of the board before they can get their patent. Um, but I know later she was not a big fan of the board because she believed that the board lied about some family drama regarding um, some family heirlooms of the South. Yeah. Uh, and um, so she wasn't like thrilled about the board at the end of her life. Um, I mean, she got married. They moved to Colorado. They adopted a daughter. Ernest, her husband, became a traveling salesman, and she kind of disappeared off the map. Um, a lot of the newspaper articles that even mention her um, Ernest Nosworthy were Ernest Nosworthy checked in at the at the blah 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 hotel, and he departed on this day because that's what the news reported on back then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so she, she passed in Colorado. She, that's where she's buried. And Merch is in Colorado, I believe. And, yeah, yeah. um, so he actually had a lot of contacts with her family. Um, oh, wow. and he actually helped mend some family drama. Um, and, uh, so they were indebted to him about that. Um, and actually, he and the Talking Board Historical Society raised money to basically get Helen a new headstone um, with a Ouija board on it to just or the Ouija logo, you yeah. know, to honor her legacy and her contribution to the Ouija board. Um, but yeah, that was that was a that was a story I didn't really know until about a year and a half ago. She was one yeah. of the la she was one of the last co ad additions <laughs> to the book. I was like, yeah, she has to go into volume one. Like, yeah, she has yeah, to. it was it was really amazing. It was uh, like I said. I mean, you point out earlier, Catherine Crow. She's introducing doppelganger and poltergeist into the vernacular uh, here in America, and you got Helen Peters Nosworthy with the Ouija board and, and we'll, well, I guess we'll continue the theme here. I'll scooch up in my notes here because another uh, woman in the book who it made an indelible imprint on pop culture, the paranormal, um, the zeitgeist is uh, Pamela Coleman Smith. Oh I was absolutely blown away. And, and like I, I, and you mentioned in the, uh, just a spoiler alert folks, and she, she did the, she drew the uh, what are now what are erroneously, I guess you could say, in a lot of ways, known as the Rider Weight Tarot Deck. And, and so, like when you mentioned in the book, you you call him the Rider Weight Smith Tarot Deck, and I'm like, am I? Wait, wait a minute, am I, is this like a Berenstein Bears situation? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute, have I have I always been getting this wrong? And then I, you know, then I read the then I read the chapter, and I'm like, I have been getting it wrong, but because I've been informed incorrectly by history of, of yeah. how this thing came about and it's like wait a minute now this lady her name should be on the, the deck it should be the it should be who i think i don't even know who rider and weight weight are but i think weight was the one who you know kind of instructed on how to do it yeah. or yeah. the ideas or whatever so it should be the weight smith deck i don't know who rider is maybe that was the one who published that was the it. publisher yeah so yeah that, not the publisher i mean he doesn't get, get any credit at all it should it should be the weight smith deck but it's yep. it's remarkable i was like like i said i'm like wait a minute what like what like this is crazy so i've i've given the the, the banal version of events so tell us sort of flesh this out and give us the the, the story here of how she wound up drawing this deck and it, it's really remarkable that she's been lost to history uh in so many ways yeah, she's not only been lost to history, but there's a lot of speculation, too, about her ethnicity. Um, mm -hmm. Every year during Black History Month, she gets included, but it's it's that one I don't I don't touch on TikTok, especially. But um, but when but there was someone else who had met her who thought she was like she was part Japanese, you know, because she I mean, she mm -hmm. her 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 features are very striking, her facial features. Um but yeah, so she, her, she was, I, I feel like her and I would have been besties. Um, Cause she's kind of like exactly like the type of person I hang out with. Um, so her father was a merchant, her mother. Um, so, so her, her parents were actually also older too. Well, her dad was in his twenties and her mom was in her thirties, but when they got married, um, her mother was the sister of an American painter by the name of Samuel Coleman. And it's speculated that Corinne may have been of J Jamaican descent, but 
as far as we know, Pamela's parents were American. And they were they were based in England, though, for the first, like, 10 years of Pamela's life. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she had her struggles. Um, she had a hard time with Cla- gender, class, racial categories, as I mentioned. Um, her family were members of the Swedenborgian New Church, so they so they very much followed the practices of Emanuel Swedenborg, who was one of the earliest psychics, you could say, um, yeah. trans mediums. Um, so Pamela already was exposed to, like, spiritism and mysticism in her young life. And then her father took a job in Jamaica, uh, he was working as an auditor for the West India Improvement Company. Um, and so they lived in Jamaica for several years. And then when Pamela was 15, she went to go study art at the Pratt Institute in New York. Yeah. Um, and she learned about various art styles. She learned about Art Nouveau. Her mother got sick while she was in school. And then so Pamela dropped out of school and went back to Jamaica. She actually never got her her art degree. Um, and she basically became her mother's caregiver until she passed. And then Pamela kind of became the the run the the the, the head of the household, so not headed like head of the household, like paying for things, but she ran the household. Right. Um so she wasn't really able to be an artist. But then um she also had a fascination with Jamaican folklore, and she even contributed to the Journal of American Folklore when she was 18, So, which is pretty oh, wow. amazing. And she actually did performances reenacting Jamaican folklore stories. Um, so, But she wasn't too far away from art. In 1897, she got her first ex- ex- exhibition at William – Macbeth's gallery yeah so she so she was 19 when this all happened for her um and yeah so she actually started a she started to have a career as an illustrator and she created her own illustration books and then her father actually ended up introducing her to um Bram Stoker (laughs) <laughs> yes, I remember this part of the. Yes, yes, I remember yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, it's such she, a weird, yeah, such a weird character to pop up. And it's like, wait a minute, the Brom? <laughs> yeah, and she actually called him Uncle Brahmi. So uh, they, so they were close. And Ellen Terry, that was another one who she was introduced to, and they actually um, commissioned Pamela to create an 18-page illustrated brochure for um, the Lyceum Theater. Um, so. Pamela actually went on tour with um, with Ellen Terry, Bram Stoker, and Henry Irving. Yes, I remember um, this story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she actually became really <laughs> good friends with them. They actually gave her a nickname. She became known as Pixie. Um, she was also a costumer, a stage designer. Um, Ellen Terry really took Pamela under her wing. Um and then when Pamela wasn't touring with the theater group, she actually was a kindergarten teacher, which I thought was yeah, kind I thought of hilarious. That was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My God, uh, wow. uh, um, but then Pamela's father passed away. So she was just 21 years old and she was without both parents. Um, so uh, Henry Irving and Ellen Terry actually ended up taking on like a pseudo parent role for her. Um, and they actually helped her find work. Um so she illustrated Bram Stoker's last novel. Um, she uh, did work for William Yeats or Yeats. Um, she did work for Jack Yeats. Um, she opened her own studio in 1901. So, I mean, she was really making a name for herself in art. So it's really not surprising that she would get, and she was also involved in getting involved in occultism too. Right. So she became the, a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And that's where she met Wait, A.E. Wait. Um, they were both members of the Isis Urania Lodge um, of the Golden Dawn. And then Pamela started to have an interest in astrology, which would become the foundation for her tarot deck um, drawings. So Waite was a big fan of Pamela. He loved her work. Um, and then he found these occult manuscripts um, that related to tarot. And yeah. he, But he wanted to make the deck more meaningful, so that's where he brought in Pamela to do the illustrations. Um, 
and it's believed that Waite didn't expect Pamela to go into like such complexities and depth in her designs. Yeah. Um, just because like when when you meet her, apparently she was just so playful and naive, and but yet she really created some depth with these cards. Yeah. Um, what blows my mind though was that she was not paid a lot of money at all. Right. She yeah. Did you not, mentioned that in the book. Yeah. She yeah. did. Yeah. Because actually, towards the end of her life. She did convert to Catholicism, which I thought was a very, like, 180 switch. Um, But she was actually writing to um, people, you know, to former clients. Um, She also uh, wrote back to William Macbeth asking, like, hey, can you give me any work? I didn't make a lot of money from the tarot deck. Um, I really need money. And um, she actually took on a more... Uh, a more somber religious perspective into life. Um, yeah. So, and, and yeah, she had quite a journey too. Like she was very much like bohemian type of person, you know, it's speculated that she was also queer. Um, you know, she hosted like art, art painting sessions in her home, poetry readings. Like right, she was right. very much artist as bohemian artist, like at the, biggest extreme but then she pivots and converts to catholicism and her god i i will never forget this her occupation when she died was listed as a spinster of independent means (laughs) which i was like wow okay yeah yeah i found it was very interesting so she did pass away at home when she was 73 um so yeah, yeah it's just she, remarkable you know yeah. uh, uh, i mean interrupt you there the be the, the big part yeah it, it sort of captures in a sense the theme of the marginalization of women in the paranormal it's like her name should be on the deck it's really yeah. remarkable it's really kind of stunning to me when i discovered this in the book i was like I just always assumed the, the, they. I was always assumed either Ryder or Wait, whoever these people are. I always yep. assumed what one of them drew them. I didn't know it was really like, oh wait, you're telling me, no pun intended. Wait, you're you know, this someone else drew the yep. thing. It was like yep. that's really wild. Um, it it really it's is crazy. And um, I have a book. Like I I basically bought like two biographies on her because the books were beautiful because they also include all of her art and if you look at all of her art outside of the tarot deck you can definitely see like oh see yeah tarot, yeah. You, yeah you can see the tarot you can see tarot in there yeah. um which is really which is really neat so she was right, very right. talented very now, did talented this, did this thing like take off right away after they came out with it or was it sort of like a cult no pun intended like a cult following sort of like underground thing that you know, only became bigger later from my understanding, it took off pretty quickly, okay. yeah. which is right. why, like, her not making a lot of money from it, which probably means she took a flat rate right, as a commission right. yeah. um, and, not, and didn't do royalties, which is a shame. Um, right. Yeah, and that's why even back then it was so shocking that she didn't make a lot of money from the deck because it was – it was a huge hit. I mean, because the Ouija board was also in existence, I think, by this point. Um, so, and Ouija yeah. board sales were also high, right, um, right. especially after wars, um, you know, around the time of war. Um, Ouija board sales, tarot card sales were were, were skyrocketing because, you know, lack of closure and all that good yeah. stuff that happened in the 18th, 19th, 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now I'm going to put you on the spot here. Maybe this was on me. I wasn't sure. No, I saw you. I saw that. <laughs> so Anna Goodrich Freer. Okay. Uh... Yes. Now in the beginning of the chapter, you say that she may or may not have played a role in the death of one of SPR's most prominent members, but that's never mentioned in the chapter unless I missed it. I read it like two or three times and I'm like, where's the part with the mysterious death? Uh, is it yeah. <laughs> Okay, what's, can, can you that, enlighten that, me to that? That is a little bit of my bad, but um, oh, okay, well, I didn't follow I didn't up know. on it. Yeah, well, a lot of it's because um, a lot of it, gosh, the death surrounding this particular SBR member is um, God, where are you? Murky at best. That? It's murky at best. Yeah, it's very okay. much uh, murky at best because she was one of the last. Um, 
she was one of the last people um, to, oh my gosh, why is his name, why is his name escaping me? Um, oh my gosh, it's like, I got Myers, I'm trying to think, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, so with, um, yeah, because I, I briefly, did I briefly mention him in the Eleanor Sidgwick? Um, maybe. Maybe. Nope. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I apologize. I didn't mean to. Oh, you're it. fine. You're fine. I have like OCD. That part was like, I literally went back and read the chapter like four times. I'm like, where did I? Yeah. Is this oh, it was Edmund. Of... <laughs> it was Edmund Gurney. Yeah. So I, so I, I mentioned, so I think what happened was I mentioned it. Then I looked into the bias that Trevor Hall has against SPR. And mm-hmm. I was like, eh, maybe not follow up on that. But yeah. yeah. So Edmund Gurney, overall, it's believed that Edmund Gurney committed suicide. Yeah. But there is some questions. So Ada Goodrich Freer was one of the last people to see Edwin, Edmund Gurney alive. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, it, it's it's a little messy, but it's a, it's a, it's, okay. it's, it's a spicy one. Um, Edmund Gurney, God, I feel he's he's somebody I feel bad about. So it's it's more it's more believed that maybe he accidentally overdosed on um, chloroform. Oh, Jesus! I believe that's what it was. Um, so he, yeah, it was an overdose of chloroform. Um, so. It could have been suicide, um, but right. then Trevor Hall was like, oh, I think Ada Goodrich Freer may have been um, involved with it because, you know, it was – because she was with Arthur Thomas Myers at the time. And Trevor Hall really wanted to paint Ada in the worst light possible. He probably, yeah. could, probably got that from the chapter. So – and I felt like he was reaching for straws with a lot of it. But unfortunately, yeah. his book is probably the only biography of Ada that exists. Um, so – I want to, I actually want to do a little more research into her to kind of give her a, uh, a second chance, so to speak. Um, Cause she kind of gets painted as this seductress harlot type of thing, like sleeping her way to the top of SPR. Yeah. And we, you, being in charge of Clandon house investigations and. Right. You mentioned that, uh, well, you don't mention it that way in the book, but you mentioned that the perception that had been put forward and you, you, it was actually, I mean, you can't miss it in the book. It's on, you underline it in the mm-hmm. book where someone had, um, and you may, you will, you'll know who wrote the letter, I assume, but it was a letter taking issue with her research at this mm-hmm. place, um, you know, suggesting that it wasn't on the level or whatever. And it said simply because she's a lady, yep. she was chosen to investigate. And you, you stress that in the book um, that, that that was, you know, that was, well, I don't know what you'd even call it, the accusation or whatever. I don't know, the, the marginalization or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just kind of like, what does that have to do with it, dude? But it, clearly there was an implication there um, yep. of something nefarious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's definitely one of those things that, like, as I was reading Trevor Hall's biography of her, I, I really started to realize, I'm like, okay, we're going out of scope here with – because if, cause if she was doing faulty research, that's fine. Let's stick to the faulty research. Right. So it kind of goes from, like, she's having an affair with Myers, Frederick Myers, to she was a dom with a woman as her sub. And it's like, okay. Well, this we're is going- all in this guy's biography? Yeah, all in this guy's oh, biography. Geez. Oh, geez. yeah. He, he definitely has a... Um, he definitely has a <laughs> an obsession with Ada. Like, a part of me was like, okay, what did this woman do to hurt you? Like, show me on the right. doll where she touched you. When did this um, guy? When did this guy write this book? Like, around 60s? her time? Sixties? No, it would have been sixties oh, okay. so, right, or seventies. So. Yeah, it's Trevor okay. Hall. Let me take a look here. When was he alive? He also had a big issue with SPR, so he wrote a lot of. Um, why am I looking on the computer? I can look on my phone. Um, he wrote a lot of very disparaging um, content right. about SPR. Yeah. Um, SPR. And he sort of sounds like he sort of he had, had a bee in his bonnet for, uh, for Ada Goodrich Freer. Trevor H. Hall. There he is. Yeah, he died in 1991. So 1910 to 1991. So, yeah, he was definitely not alive when – well, when did Ada 
die. Let me take a look at my notes. Um, Ada passed away in 1931. So he would have oh, been go, actually, so. actually, there would have been, he would have been in his 30s when she died. So, yeah. you know, there may be some minor crossover, but whether or not he actually talked to her is debatable. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that's just kind of, I don't, yeah. I don't know what, yeah, it's just kind of lame that the guy's dragging her through the butt. Like, I don't know, dude. <laughs> it's just kind of, like, uh He did intrusive. that with several, yeah, he did that to several um, people in um, in SPR, too, unfortunately. Yeah. That's kind of his MO. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's disappointing, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I'm glad we talked about that. And like I said, now at least my OCD will be satisfied about the mysterious death. Um so I can't be the only one who, who rather probably lies. not. <laughs> so all right, so we're going to move on to someone else um, profiled in the book, and it, which is it's interesting in some ways. There's a lot of various people, uh, various women in the book um, exhibiting potential uh, abilities um, of various degrees, but the one who stood out in the book as sort of the most where I'm like, all right, I don't think this person is pulling off any kind of old-timey scams. Because, uh, mm-hmm. like, the Fox sisters, the whole thing with the Fox sisters, it's like, wait a minute. You know, this is this sounds like more of, like, a carnival show. Um, but especially the toe cracking. I was like, how do you, I can't, is that possible? You can crack your toes? Mm-hmm. Um, so, 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 but Lenora Piper is who I'm talking about. The white oh, yeah. Yeah, I found myself really, really taken with her uh, because I I was a straight-up believer. The more you wrote about the things that she would demonstrate, it was mm-hmm. like, okay, I don't see how – I don't see how this woman could be faking this. This is like documented events that are unfathomable. Yeah, and she had some very smart people watching her like a hawk. Right, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the thing with SPR, um, their investigations wasn't just, oh, we'll go to one seance and write up. I mean, these investigations lasted for years sometimes. Like wherever, like with Lenora Piper, wherever she went, it seems like there was always an SPR member in, in the audience to document yeah. um, what was happening. So she put her – that, that's the other thing. She – voluntarily put herself through quite the amount of scrutiny and yeah, yeah. evaluation and examination. Um, back then, uh, today, I mean, there would be some researchers getting sued, but back then when they were testing mediums, like when they would put a media, when a medium would go into a trance, like they would burn them, they would cut them, like, you know, they would yeah. stab them with needles. Like they, they yeah. did all these things to try to stimulate a reaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and there is even some very questionable possible sexual assault that may have happened with these exams too. It's like Jesus. with how they were, ex- well, especially well, with I those guess, who yeah. excreted ectoplasm. Um, I'll let you figure that out, nice. what those examinations may have been like. Um, yeah. But yeah, so she put herself through yeah, yeah. a lot of scrutiny, and um, I mean, there was a couple of people who were like, eh, eh, but again, like I said, she had some very smart people that were evaluating her, and also, um, and William James was not someone who would go light on people either. Like yeah. William James is pretty hardcore, um, but she was also somebody that seemed to be fairly honorable with her intentions like with some other mediums like Florence Cook uh who's going to be in volume 2 her her story was too much of a circus for me to put in volume 1 i was like okay i i need to make more sense of florence cook yeah. um but it's alleged that florence cook had a, may have had an affair with her spr researcher that tainted his um yeah. crooks um with painted that would have tainted his perspective of her and her right, and yeah. his research but with lenora piper um there wasn't any speculation of like that there may have been an affair happening um it seems like she was pretty honorable and quite legit i mean not saying having yeah. an affair is not honorable i mean get your kicks where you get your kicks but um <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know have live your right. best life um but she seemed to be the one that was the most straightforward um wasn't 
intimately involved with any of her researchers. Um, and the researchers that were involved seemed to be, they didn't have a bias. They were very open-minded. Um, I mean, she even got, uh, I mean, she got tested by skeptics too, but um, there was one, I think it's Stanley Hall, I think is his name. Um, he wasn't exactly nice to Lenora when yeah, he was yeah. testing her, but then, the yeah. yeah um, and that kind of like deflated her a little bit, which is a little sad, but um but she, you know, she just kept going, and she was able to provide some very invaluable data for, you right. know, researchers, which inadvertently affects how we research today, so. Yeah, absolutely. And what was cool about, I guess, the, uh, was interesting and kind of neat, is she pops up again later in the book, and it's like, I'm already, I'm, already, you know, I'm reading the book, and I'm already like, all right, this, Lenora seems legit. Like I, I buy, I buy into Lenora, and then we get to the Doctor Florence Barrett chapter, and uh, Doctor Florence Barrett is a a superstar medical prominent figure in London, and um, gets into all of this. As I said when I asked you, how'd you get mixed up in all this? She gets mixed up in all this uh, when her husband dies. And a friend gets a letter from Lenora, who I'm just like, what? Wait, my Lenora? Like, I'm flipping back to them. I'm like, yeah, that's that's Lenora. And and <laughs> yep. Lenora sends the letter, and she has a message from the late husband to a friend from, like, wicked far. Like, that. there's no way that it's all so convoluted that it's like, there's no way this could possibly be fake. Like, I'm sorry. Like, like it's yeah. just a, you know, that's. That kind of, those are the kind of things that you read and you're like, all right, there's something to this. You can't really, I, I don't, I don't think Lenora spontaneously decided to write this person a letter with a message, like, and there's no way that the doctor facilitated this. So it's like, well, how do you explain it? It's just weird. Yeah, it is. It's very weird. Um, gosh, Florence Barrett. Yeah, she really was the superstar of the, of women's health back then. You know, we try to ignore the eugenics part of it, but in her beliefs, but you know, um, <laughs> there's not, not everyone's perfect. I mean, I got a couple of questionable women in these books, um, but yeah, Florence Barrett, I mean, she was married to one, one of SPR's founders, um, but she didn't really think anything of it, like you said, until after um, Sir, her husband um, died. And yeah, and the fact that you have a medical doctor, a well-established medical doctor who has wings named after her in hospitals right. that are still standing today. Um, I mean, she wrote a whole book about conversations with her husband after he died. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Lenora Piper um, sneaks in there and there's actually a weird, like I keep meaning to make like a chart or a tree or a flow chart or something of how all these women are connected. Yeah. Because, yeah I love that. Like, like Eleanor Sidgwick tested Helena Blavatsky and then Blavatsky, you know, mentored Annie Besant, you know, so it's like, and then Annie yeah, Besant yeah. did this and it's, it's like they're, everyone oddly is you, connected. Yeah. I think you mentioned way. one of the women in the book, like put up the funds for the Zenzer cards to be made, uh, yep. something like that. So yeah, I noticed that connection that you mentioned in the book too. Yeah. It would be, I would love that. That would be a really cool flow chart yeah. of uh, like influences and, and connections. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like Thelma Moss, who <coughs> was a Broadway actress before she got into parapsychology, you know, she tested Lorraine Warren. So it's like everyone has some kind of weird connection there um, in some sort of way. Uh, I mean, Gladys Osborne Leonard pops up a lot throughout the book. Cause you know, she was a very prominent medium, medium at the time. Um, so she was, she was getting tested a lot. Um, but yeah, it's just really cool to see how everyone kind of runs into each other and syncs with each other in a way or inspires in each other. Yeah, yeah. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm not like a huge um, paranormal history buff. I guess you could say beyond like the, like I know UFO history and cryptozoology. Yeah. I never kind of really got dug too deeply into paranormal history. So I was like blown away by just uh, talking about sort of connections and recurrences and um, that kind of thing. SPR, 
Like they, I feel like if, if anyone from like Netflix or something is watching, like how about a Netflix series, like a Mad Men version of SBR? Because there's like oh so gosh. many, there's so many connections and so many characters and so many, it's like, this is like a soap opera in and of itself, this SPR organization. Um, <laughs> I would, oh, I would yeah. love a show like that. It would be awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, especially when one of the founders had an affair with another founder's brother. Like it's, it's spicy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. very it's spicy. Like soap opera. Yeah. It really like it, is. Yeah. It really is. So, ah, that'd be a good show actually. All right. Yeah. That'd how do be I, cool. how do I pitch something to Netflix anyway? Yeah. <laughs> I, I need some kind of credit on that. If it happens, Netflix, get in touch with us. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make this show happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you just mentioned before about someone, Having it, yeah, having affairs with like their uh, people who were studying them or whatever. It's like, wow, yeah. this must be. There's a book there just on this SBR group. I don't know if anyone's written that, but it was like, yeah, they they keep recurring throughout your book, and it's like this is quite the organization. <laughs> That's kind of my I read my yeah. eyebrows as I was I was going along. Now, credit to you in the book is also a skeptic, uh, Rose Mackenberg, who I loved. <sighs> I just. I found I her, love kind of her adorable. Like I just really liked her a lot. Uh, just, just awesome. Just kind of like talk about fit for a TV show. There's another one that you could you could do right there. Rose Mackenberg. Tell people about Rose <sighs> Mackenberg, uh, skeptic yes. extraordinaire. Yes. Oh my gosh, I love Rose Mackenberg, also known as Mac. Um, so she, um, <laughs> so she was. I guess you could say a protege of Harry Houdini. Um, Harry Houdini was more than a magician. He was also out there debunking uh, psychics, especially during the spiritualism movement. Um, and it got, and he got to a point where he was actually sending out like a small army of secret agents to cities. Like if a psychic was going on tour or a medium was going on tour, he would send uh, like a, uh, or 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 if he was going on tour and going to town, he would send a small army of skeptics, secret agents, to go and check out the local mediums and then come back and report. Um, and Rose Mackenberg, she had already exhibited some skeptical like beliefs, and it actually caught the attention of Harry Houdini. And she was such a rock star that she became his right hand person. Yeah. Um, like she would wear disguises. That's what I love about. It. Yeah, yeah. There's and, a picture in the book of her, like all these different disguises. I'm like, what is it? I love this lady. Right, and like the names, like she would do like Francis yes. Roud, so be fraud or fraud. Um, Alicia Bunk, all is a bunk. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> she was brilliant. But yeah, she would be like a school teacher. She had a matron costume, servant girl. Um, she like she had all of these personas so that people, you know, these mediums wouldn't recognize her. Right. And I was just like, this is so awesome. And I mean, she did put herself out there and was at risk at times because she did get assaulted a couple times by, or propositioned and or propositioned by some very questionable, uh, mediums. But, and then yeah. Harry Houdini would call them out next time he was in, on tour. And sometimes like whole riots would start, but, um, she was neat. She was really cool. Yeah. And she was somebody who – she was a skeptic, but she was always open and hopeful that something weird really would happen. Um, right. I found it interesting that she always kept her apartment well lit towards the end of her life because she was tired of dark rooms. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's believed that she investigated about a 1,000 mediums. Um, she was one of the people that – Houdini left a secret code for um, those of you who don't know Harry Houdini had this agreement with his wife and several close friends that you know there would be a secret code that he would communicate in the afterlife yeah. um, and Rose was one of those people who got a who got a code um, and then she declared like that message didn't come through um, she never did report on it um, but yeah she was really yeah. awesome and then she, she kind of cool. became she kind of got thrown into the forefront as like, I think she was called like the spook spy and um, Ghostbuster, like before Ghostbusters was a thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. She was called a Ghostbuster. Yeah, um, yeah. Just really she, cool. It's, she was and it's interesting, in a, I guess, in a way. Like, look, I don't know the history. I mean, I don't know the skeptic community very well at all, aside from sort of 
the very basics, but it's like, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe you would know. Um, has she been marginalized in the skeptic community? I wonder. Like, I wonder if it's just the marginalization happens in all these fields, even even in the skeptical community. I, I don't know. It You know, it has happened. Um, I've met skeptics who didn't know who Rose was. They knew who, who they knew who Houdini was and course, his wife, yeah, yeah. but they didn't know Rose. Um, she is becoming more known now, which is great. Um, unfortunately, there even there's even like believers who marginalize her. Um, I attended a Victorian spiritualism panel at a big convention last year. And there was a panel on spiritualism. And I was like, okay, I want to go. I want to go yeah. sit in on that. And they were trying to position the split, the skeptics in the spiritualism movement as being anti-female and going against women because it was all yeah. men debunking these women. And I just quietly raised my hand. I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah. And I said, actually, I'm like, well, actually, I'm like, eh. Look into Rose Mackenberg. She was Houdini's right hand woman. Um, she was very active in debunking mediums in the spiritualism movement. Yeah, so yeah. Um, maybe not saying that it wasn't an attack on women, like for skeptics to attack the mediums, but it wasn't all men. There were women involved too, and it's important to acknowledge the women who were on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of got a couple of dirty looks from one from the panelists that had said that claim initially, <laughs> and I'm like, sorry. Um, but it's, but it's important to one, we don't want to spread that, that I don't want to call it misinformation because it almost sounds intentional, but we don't want to misconception. We don't want to sp spread that misconception and also inadvertently ignoring a very important woman in right. the skepticism field. Right, exactly. And I think as, even though we're kind of team paranormal, it's like, you gotta have, you gotta like respect, man. It's like, you gotta that uh, you got to tip your cap. She's yep. awesome. So, and if you're, if you're busting amazing. fraudulent mediums and shit, I mean, team paranormal should be on, should be for that. Cause <laughs> it's, uh, we're trying to get to you the bottom think. of this. Yeah. You would, <laughs> you would yeah, think, um, right? <laughs> you would think. <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting. You make a point. It's sort of trace this more, almost more the earlier, uh, women, but it kind of is an overarching theme in a lot of ways, is that the paranormal provided an outlet for them that it, it, there weren't a lot of opportunities. There really just mm -hmm. weren't a lot of opportunities for women, especially back in the times of Cameron, of, uh, I keep wanting to say Cameron Crowe, like the director, uh, Catherine, Catherine Crowe. Um, and and they, they used these opportunities to advance uh, women's rights and women's issues. I think it's really admirable, and it's instructive uh where it's like okay this is how these again it's like you learn i learned so much from the book where it's like right, there weren't that many opportunities so they, they 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 found niches in the worlds of spiritualism and stuff like that and then use those opportunities to advance uh women's rights and and you know voting rights and all the you know i think people i guarantee you, people young people who are listening who don't understand what it was like like to <laughs> back in the 1850s um, it was, it was a whole different world. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that, that, that's a interesting sort of aspect of the book that is, is uh, I, I wanted to note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, spiritualism movement gave some incredible opportunities for women to be more independent. Um, right. I mean, uh, spiritualism movement i mean there were i mean there were some predatory behaviors happening like a lot of older men would marry like the teenage mediums so that they could be emancipated from their parents oh, um, God. and possibly for other reasons um but you know spiritualists were very much involved in the abolition movement um right. suffragist movement That's um funny. i did find a woman of color who was part of the spiritualism movement and she's going to be in volume two. Oh wow um yeah, so she was a delightful discovery. Um, anytime I found someone, I was like, oh, that's nice to meet you. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. I'm going to go look. Um, for volume one, it was kind of like Helen Peters Nosworthy, but also um, Radcliffe Hall and Una Trowbridge, um, the lesbian power couple of the paranormal. Um, I like to call them that. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, so, so, that, so there was opportunities with the spiritualism movement for women to – ironically 
you know, the only way they, I guess they could get people to listen to them was to channel like the spirit of a man and take on a male voice and communicate. And then they would be listened to. I did yeah, find that a little ironic. That- yeah, you make that point in the book. Like I said, it didn't really dawn on me. But yeah, yeah, it's like, you're like, oh, well, we could, let's talk to her because she's, she's talking to Brian in the afterlife. It's like, yep. oh, wait a minute, you're really, yeah. Um, that was, yeah, yeah. So it, it, like I said, a takeaway from the book that resonated with me in a big way. Um, sort of moving into the modern uh, people, I thought uh, I was really interested. I had never heard of Akio Gibo. And I oh, Aiko Gibo, yeah. Aiko Gibo, yeah. Uh, and I was blown away again. Um, I, another person like Lenora, where I was like, okay, I think, I think this is like on the on the level here. This is pretty, this is pretty remarkable stuff. What what she's doing here. Yeah, so she's another one whose legacy does keep getting buried, and it's very frustrating, especially yeah. with um, the Mary King's close um, and the spirit of Annie. Um, I was part of a documentary about scariest places in the world. And they did talk about Mary King's close. And I, during my interview, I said, Iko Gibo's name at least a half dozen times. I was like, Iko Gibo, you know, was visiting and she felt this. And Iko Gibo went, <laughs> yeah, yeah. went to the store to get this Barbie doll. And Iko Gibo went back down and gave the doll to Annie and <laughs> made it. Iko Gibo is the reason why all these people bring the dolls to Annie. And, and then sure enough, they used somebody else's interview for that spot. And they said, oh, a medium detected oh, spirit God. of Annie. And I was like, no. Yeah, that's I mean, ridiculous. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And I'm like, but they showed her picture. But they did show her picture. But huh. I'm like, okay, you show her picture, but you don't say her name. Like, Yeah, that's pretty And ridiculous. And you know this in the book. The biggest takeaway that I want people to walk away with is please say their names. Like, say Absolutely, their names yeah. and talk about them. Um, so I was a bit – I was a little – I was – while I was grateful for the opportunity, I was very frustrated when I saw that. Um, so she, her legacy is one that still keeps getting buried. And I'm like, why is it so difficult to give her credit? Um, and plus, she also – very well could have been a part of like the early ghost hunting show format because Japan in the 80s and early 90s, you know, they would have, ironically, like during their daytime TV, they would have segments on like ghosts. Yeah. And um, Aiko Giba was at the forefront of that. And you, you can actually watch her episodes on YouTube. I mean, they're in Japanese, but you can watch them and kind of get an idea of what's happening. Um. And if you look at the way that it's shot, it's like very, it's, it's reminds me a lot of like ghost adventures, early ghost hunters. And I'm just like, well, this is interesting. Yeah. 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 You know, it cool. was almost like what they did with Power Rangers and using like the B-roll, oh, from, yeah, you yeah. know, B-roll for the battles and such. And I was like, this is interesting. I want, I, I wonder where these producers got this idea to use it, this certain format. Cause the camera angles and everything. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I'm like this is oddly uh, familiar. So, and she may have had a hand in that. Um, I mean, I know producers are a thing too, but I mean, given how popular she was in Japan, I have family yeah. in Japan and I also have um, friends in Japan. So I just reached out to them. I'm like, Hey, do you know who Aiko Gibo is? And they're like, Oh yeah, we do. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. It's oh yeah, yeah. Well, that it, it raises an interesting sort of, um, I guess, challenge in a way. I mean, for lack of a better term, but it's like in reading the book, it's like I can only imagine uh, because you, aside from Aiko Gibo, who's Japanese, um, and you mostly cover British and American uh, women, and I can only imagine. I mean, we don't even really know much about sort of the history of the paranormal in a lot of these other countries, period. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm sure there were so many other pioneering women that played roles in their respective countries and and regions that, that, you know, we may never know about. Just like, think about like, like like Russia has a rich, deep history of this kind of, of uh, the occult and the paranormal. And it's like, there must be multiple, Mm -hmm. uh, multiple women just there, Latin America, um, mm-hmm. you know, other parts of Europe, France, Germany, that kind of thing. So it's it's like there's there's no shortage, really. I bet. 
Yeah, well, you might be interested in volume two because I I do um, dive into China a little bit with volume oh, two. Not necessarily. One. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you you do bring up something interesting, and really, what I'm going off of is like what's documented and, and exactly. what yeah, exists yeah. in historical records, and it makes it hard because the documenting of with other countries is sometimes not consistent, but it's also like, does the library of Congress have it? Does the local library have this data? And what yeah. can I find on internet archive and, um, and searching. And I, I found Ico Gibo a little bit by accident. Um, Cause I was actually doing research on Mary King's close. Um, I had never been there, but I had, but I was made aware of like a, of a parapsychology experiment that at Edinburgh Castle and Mary King's Close, and I was like, well, where'd the story of Annie come from? So I did some more research on Annie, and then Iko Gibo's name came up on an Instagram post of all things, um, yeah. and I was like, oh, oh, why don't we know about her? So yeah, I've been exactly, trying to yeah. do a little bit more deeper dive into international side of it. That's um, awesome. But it makes it tough because the documentation is tough. But yeah, it's a because right now you're right. It's a lot of American and British women. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do have one Canadian uh, coming up, and then um, you know, and I like I said, I found the the uh, woman of color who was a spiritualist because I'm really still right, trying right. to drive diversity mm -hmm. um, with it. But a lot of times I'm looking into like. There was an ancient, there was an ancient Chinese woman that I found who wasn't necessarily like an occultist, but she, but maybe more of a spiritualist, yeah. but it's also like, well, what was her impact? You know, what did she influence? And that's the other thing I have to look at is, right, you know, right. did she create a tradition or did she create a methodology? Um, cause that's, cause there's so many women out there that could be included, but it's like, okay, what was their contribution? Not saying that what they right, did wasn't right. good or good enough, but it's like, you know, is it like Catherine Crow or is it, you yeah, know, yeah, is it yeah. something that has rippled out into something exactly. that's leveraged yes. in the future? Because otherwise, I mean, I could probably write this series for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, a couple in the book that I actually didn't have in the notes, but I, I think I had kind of been like, all right, well, I don't know if I'm going to, I got, I had to cut some, <laughs> but, but we're doing pretty good on time. So. Let's talk about Radcliffe Hall and Una Trowbridge. As you mentioned, you called them the lesbian power couple. Um, they just remarkable folks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Radcliffe also went John. by the name John. Yeah, right, right. that that was a tricky chapter for me to write because you know pronouns matter, and they are exactly. A thing. Yeah, it was a very and, yeah no, it was very yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. Yeah, Radcliffe had a very interesting journey. She, and I'm using she because that's the pronouns that she used. Um, if Radcliffe was alive today in our modern times, that may have that may have been a little different. Um, but Radcliffe came into, I mean, was in money, like very wealthy, thanks to family. And Radcliffe was like, you know what? I don't have to marry. I don't have to get married to a man to survive. I'm going to dress up in men's clothing and I'm going to live my true self and live my life. There you go. Um, I mean, Radcliffe Hall wrote probably one of the most prominent pieces of queer literature, um, The Well of Loneliness. Um, there was some speculation that Una and Radcliffe may have been fascists, but again, you know, we have Francis or we have um, Florence Barrett with her eugenics, so it's like, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it was also yeah. early 1900s, 1930s, 1940s. It's like, eh. yeah, it was all um, the time. But what's interesting about uh, Radcliffe is it was uh, of the time. It was, I imagine, it was like, I mean, that takes a certain amount of guts to to live your life the way you want to live your life during that time. That was what blew me away about, about that's her. that's the thing uh, yeah and and, and and una too um they when i when i tell people about una trowbridge and radcliffe hall they were not in the closet like you right, can exactly. look at pic you see pictures of them and it's like oh you know right away right, <laughs> like right. it's you know and um and, you know, and ironically, how they got into spiritualism and parapsychology was because Radcliffe had been in a relationship with Una's cousin for a significant amount of time. And her name, uh, nickname was Lady. And then towards the end of Lady's life, um, Radcliffe meets Una and Una and Radcliffe kind of start this affair while Lady is on her deathbed. Um, Lady passes away. And then there's like this guilt of 
maybe we should have held off on starting this relationship until after she passed, you know, that kind of guilt. Right, and right. then um, Radcliffe got a letter from someone saying, hey, you need to check out this medium who was Gladys Osborne Leonard. Um Radcliffe goes, does a sitting with Gladys, and she and Gladys seems to know things about Radcliffe that no one else would know, and it's indicative that it's possibly a lady coming through. And so Radcliffe's like, okay, I'm going to come back, brings Una Trowbridge with her next time. <laughs> they always have someone recording whenever, like, they're doing a sitting with Gladys Osborne Leonard. <clears throat> and... um yeah, it just kind of turned into this thing where they, um, they did they did the they did the investigation, they did the write ups. Um, yeah, yeah. They they were really good at documenting what they were working on too. Um, I mean, they they were they did some pretty great work with that, and then um, and ironically. They were encouraged by a very prominent member of SPR. Um, oh my gosh! And again, I'm forgetting his name. It's all these people uh, <laughs> in SPR. It's that SPR, SPR again. Yeah. yeah, it's it's again SPR. Um, so, um, so they end up submitting their investigation of Gladys Osborne Leonard to um, the proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research, and um, yeah, and then they become council members. So yeah. they were very much in – In they were in. They were in it. Right, um, right. They, they were in it to win it. And, yeah. um, and kind and of again, trailblazers. trailblazers. They were. Huge they really were. And, again, you know, you look at them. They were not in the closet. And SPR oh, was like, yeah. yeah, you're welcome here. So um, SPR yeah. kind of became the safe haven for queer people during, you know – 19th 20th century england um which is incredible which is absolutely incredible yeah yeah um all right so we i gotta wrap you up with a couple of super contemporary names to uh, two women wonderful women who actually were on been all of america in the past and uh who we lost in, in the last few years mm -hmm. and and um who i was thrilled to see were included in the book um starting with rosemary ellen guiley who i I was in awe of her when I had her on But All of America. I think it was kind of like one of those, like, I don't even know. She is such a titan, and she's so, uh, she has such a wide array of expertise that I'm like, I don't even know where to begin with this interview. Like, uh, I haven't gone back and listened to it in a long time. But I've actually cited parts of our conversation in future interviews because stuff had come up in that interview that stayed with me. I, in the episode a couple weeks ago with Josh Kutchin, I mentioned the conversation, that conversation with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. She was tremendous. Her, the sheer amount of material that she produced is staggering. Um, it really, really is. Uh, and, uh, I mean, talk a little bit about Rosemary Ellen Guiley, um, you know, because you, 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 you include her in the book here, too, you know, and, and yeah. right, rightfully so. I'm glad she's, I'm glad she's in the the first volume in a way it's like the first hall of fame class or something like that it's kind of like well earned and well deserved yeah she was incredible i had the pleasure of meeting her like a year a couple of years before she passed um i regret i never got a photo with her though um and i didn't talk to her more because i was also like intimidated and very much yeah. i was like yeah i'm like that's rosemary Ellen guy yeah, yeah. You know, it's one of those yeah, exactly, things. Yeah. Um, she was amazing. And, um, yeah, so she was actually somebody uh, – also, her legacy was a catalyst for writing the book, too, because, I, I mean, I have a little bit of a, of a presence on TikTok. And um, I was I mentioned Rosemary Ellen Guiley during a TikTok Live, and, and, a, and a, a younger investigator was like, who? And I'm oh, like – I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, oh, okay, let's talk, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, she wrote so many books, too, and I'm just like, man, she's inspirational. Um, yeah, so her legacy was something I really wanted to make sure was at least in print. And um, so I got help from several people to write her chapter. Um, Lisa yeah. Crick was one, um, someone she men mentored, John Zaffis. Um, helped out quite a bit and then um another guy named kevin 
uh, who worked with her quite a bit. And then her husband actually chatted with me too. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yeah, so he chatted with me for quite a bit to talk about her legacy. Um, you know, as you know, as like as someone from the outside, you know, what was all this like for you? And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Joe, um, Joe was Joe was a great guy. Um, I ended up sending him a copy of the book too. It's like, hey, you know, here. Oh, that's the, great. Yeah, so I, I really, I really wanted to make sure like she was in the book and her legacy was definitely in print somewhere. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she was, she was, she was a powerhouse, and that's a tremendous loss to the field too. Oh, it's absolutely. A huge, yeah. huge loss. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think most of the listeners know. Like I said, she was on the show before, so it's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, the BOA listeners, they're old heads. So they know they know Rosemary Ellen Galley. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just, just tremendous. Um, uh, yeah, an incredible legacy. And I, I, I think that, I hope that, you know, she's so recent that people won't forget her. But I think also, in a way, it's definitely the women have been marginalized but there's something i don't know with our contemporary culture where it's like i just think that that this his, the history of all this in general is kind of like getting lost as we go along which is weird because that you would think that there with all the information available online there would be a better understanding of history but it seems like um you know even like a brad steiger i'm sure if you mentioned brad steiger on your tip there'd be plenty of people who are like who are you talking about it's mm -hmm. like so it's just kind of it's just kind of a bummer, uh, especially I've been around forever. And so I had a lot of these people on the show, you know, so yep. it's like Brad Steiger, uh, you know, Stan Friedman, ring a bell, Jim Mars, you hear these mm -hmm. people. It's like, and there are people out there who are like, no, I don't know any of, that, or any of them are. It's like, what? Like, what? How do you not know who these people are? Um, another super cool lady in the book, uh, Linda Godfrey. I, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. This see you have the same kind of there was just something about Linda Godfrey. She's just such a sweet lady, and I think that in a sense, there's almost like a like a vindication in a way. If we talk about the women we've talked about earlier in the book, we talk about uh, earlier in the conversation, we talk about you know Pamela Coleman Smith never gets any credit for the tarot card. Uh, Helena Helen uh, Nosworthy never gets any credit for naming the Ouija board. Catherine Crow, no, no credit really for bringing in poltergeist and doppelganger. At least there's some kind of like karmic vindication in a way as you wrap up the book. Linda Godfrey, she is the beast of Bray Road. Like we know she will forever be the one who put beast of Bray Road on the map. And the story mm -hmm. itself is, as you tell it, like in the book, it's just so amazed. Like, like she's kind of like, it, there's no shenanigans. She just like stumbled into this thing that became a phenomenon mm -hmm. and became a pillar of, you know, a fixture in the cryptozoological community. So, um, you know, yeah. I, I, I love Linda Godfrey. She was so, so sweet. I had the chance to meet her a few years back uh, at one of Lauren Coleman's conferences up in Portland and uh, just the nicest, nicest lady and, and just a wonderful, wonderful lady. Yeah. She was one that I regret, regrettably never had a chance to meet, but I did talk to um, Jay. I always butcher his last name, Batchichin. Um, I talked to Jay and Jay and her worked, I mean, they, they lived not too far from each other as well. So, and they were very close friends. Um, like she kind of took on a grandmother role with his, his kids and, um, and hearing her legacy through his perspective was really, truly an honor, was really an honor to yeah. um, to cover that. And, and with the more modern ones, I really wanted to make sure, like, hey, at least I'm talking to family members or friends or mentees, yeah. um, colleagues, just to kind of get a picture of what her, their legacy was like. Um, and everybody, for the most part, with all of the women, with all of the more modern women in the book, were very kind and very generous with their time. So, yeah. Um, because really, it's like I could tell Linda's story, but I didn't know Linda personally, so that's right, why I right. leaned on Jay. It's like, hey, tell me about Linda. Like, tell me about what she meant to you. Tell me about what yeah. her legacy is and what people should do to honor her memory. Exactly, yeah. And Rosemary and Linda are sort of special cases in the sense where it's like they just passed away a few years ago, so it's like – Yeah, uh, these and other... not too far apart from each other either. Which no, is... no. That's no. a huge hit. Again, it was a huge hit to the community, especially for women in the community. Absolutely. Like, yeah. That's a, that's a hit. <laughs> um, 
So I, I, I think it's important. We should talk about the, the last parts. Like, what can we do? What can we do to, um, you know, keep the spirit of these women alive and, and, and educate people about their contributions? I, I, I like to think that we've done a good job here tonight and sort of for the, but all, I, I, all this stuff I learned, <laughs> I've, I've now, I've now tried to impart it back out to uh, the listeners here tonight in the sense and, and in wanting them to, to, to educate them about the, about the stuff. Um, but they have to go get the book because we only scratch the surface. Uh, there's 38 women profiled in the book and, and I just cherry picked them. So there's tons of other fantastic women in there, but what else do you suggest that people do? Uh, you know, I would even, it's kind of weird in a way. It's like my, again, it's like my, past life school teacher thing. It's like I some of these women I kind of wanted to know more about. Pick a woman and maybe learn more about them if you're if, if you if you read Alex's book. I mean that's what I would suggest because that's kind of how I came out of it where I'm like, I'd really like to know more about Anna Goodrich Freer. Like let me let me see what what's going on with that. But but you're the author, so uh, and and this is an important part of the book. So what do you what do you think? Yeah, I always recommend to people that um you know if you want you know say their names. Um and also, you know, if you want to learn more, I have a small bibliography after each woman. So if you want yes, to like follow like up that. on my sources, um, you can definitely do that. Like there's some women like Alexandra David Neal who have like multiple books written about them. Right. Um, that, she was a trip too. Um, <laughs> tells her husband she's going to be gone for like six months to go to India. And then she's gone for 14 years. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. She was a character. Yeah. <laughs> she was yeah. a character. But um yeah so talk about them but also to kind of continue the spirit of these women especially with rosemary um oh absolutely yeah one of the heartbreaking things with rosemary was she had fought so hard to break the glass ceiling and to get more inclusion for women in paranormal media and right when she got her big break was when she got sick um I, it's heartbreaking because uh, yeah. she had worked so hard um so something that i do encourage people to do is if you're willing to be an advocate, especially with like paranormal media, paranormal events, let these networks know that you want to see more women. Yeah. Um, let them know that, or event planners, like if there's an event that you see that has a very male heavy lineup, you know, say, suggest some women like, hey, I would love to see Amanda Woomer at your event. Um, yeah. Or I think, um, or, or I think. Matsuo. Yeah, you that too. Um, <laughs> they've been taking me. I got sixteen events this year, so I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm going to mention that. I'm going to yeah. mention that. <laughs> yeah, I'm at capacity now. Um, but yeah, so it's like suggest women to yeah. be at these events. Buy their books. That's a big thing. Buy their books. Buy their you know consume their content. You know when you go on YouTube looking for paranormal content to watch. You know maybe instead of Maybe instead of, um, oh my gosh, Paranormal Twins, you tune in to Travel the Dead with Katrina Weidman and Heather Taddy. Um, you know, let those numbers and the algorithm know that women in the paranormal are valuable and should get more exposure. Um, so just like really just start supporting women in the field um, is, is a big thing I want people to do as yeah. well. Like, because the women in these, in, women of the paranormal their legacies were buried and mm. let's try to change that now so that there doesn't have to be like more volumes of women in the paranormal right, right, right. in the future because we've already done a great job of elevating women in the field that's a great way of putting it absolutely um now you mentioned uh you got a whole bunch of dates i was blown away uh i saw it on your facebook page i was like oh my god this is like yeah i don't know how you do it uh, you know, well, how are you last, going to do it? <laughs> I know. Last year I did a similar and it burned me out. I was just, man, once December hit, I just wanted to sleep. Like, yeah. just put me in hibernation. Um, so this year I am doing it a little more a bit on the local side, so it's not as yeah. much traveling. Um, some of those dates may have to drop off because either work, um, uh, cause like I said, I travel a lot for work right. and some things have changed or I'm like, Oh wait, I have to go to London. Oops. You know? So some of those dates are probably going to drop off. Um, and I may pull back a little bit just because last year it was so exhausting, but, yeah. um, but what I will be at haunted America that's run by Troy Taylor. 
Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic event. Uh, Con Carolinas, because I'm also the paranormal track director. Like, I kind of have to ah, be there. You um, and you're doing your own event, right? Yep. That's... Trivet Clinic Parafest. I'm I'm co-coordinating. And then, of course, the Paranormal Research Symposium. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of the the plan there. And then, of course, I have all these other Paracons in between, like White Hill Mansion Paracon, um, Ghost Riders Weekend, Mass Paracon. Um, Plus, I am doing a couple investigations, too, because last year I didn't really do a lot of investigating because of all the events. So, yeah, um, yeah. so I, I got a busy 2024 coming up. Um, schedule may change. We'll see. <laughs> all right. Yeah. And people can find out at alexmatsuo.com. Now, what's mm -hmm. next for you? Uh, with, with How about volume two? Because I love volume one. Now I want to get volume two, like, you know, when, when I'm going to be one of those fans who's like, when's it going to be out? So what's the, what's the plan on volume two? So the ideal plan with volume two is to have it out by Haunted America. So that would be June. Um, okay. It's a little oh, wow. over 60% done. Um, it's just one, I have to wrap up a book that I'm contracted with through a publisher. So I'm hoping to get that done within the next week. And then um, I did, cause well, last year, Women of the Paranormal Volume 1 went into editing in May, and it was out by mid-June. So okay. I was working around the clock to get make that happen, but, you yeah. know. Um, so ideally, I would like to have Women of the Paranormal Volume 2 out in June. Um, if not June, then because I have a release coming out in the fall, I may push it to – either women's history month next year for March, but that's a little bit of a long time. Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, after I get, I'm never working on two books at the same time ever again. This was a learning experience for me. Um, cause it, I kind of got the anxiety, ADHD, freeze, procrastination thing really bad. It's like, Oh, which book am I going to work on? I don't know. I don't know. Which book are you going to work on? Is so it going to be neither of them? <laughs> neither. That's what it turned into. It was like Virginia, <laughs> Women, Virginia or women? Crap, I did neither, and it's midnight now, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but now it's like, okay, the deadline for Haunted Northern Virginia is April 8th. I need to get my butt oh, boy. here. Yeah, well, I, I have 15,000 words left for that one. So that, But that one's like, oh, this house was built in 1825, and it's haunted by an old man. Yeah, you know, I see what you're saying, yeah. It's a little fluffier, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's fluffier. Um, now, have you... The volume one is primarily uh, sort of the ghost realm and, uh, uh, you know, uh, psychic type of stuff. I, I'm mm -hmm. terrible with the vernacular. But um, have you considered any – I'm sure you have considered it. Uh, but uh, is there a possibility of seeing some women maybe from some of the other sort of uh, other fields of the paranormal? I'm thinking like, uh, like a Coral Lorenzen of APRO. Or um, Mae Brussel, who was like a big time conspiracy figure in the 80s uh, or so, in the zine era. Just that was a couple of people like off the top of my head that, uh, that I was like, uh, oh, that, that would be interesting. It would be cool if they were included at some point uh, in this compendium. They, it is kind of, I don't know about the conspiracy part, but certainly Coral Lorenzen. And, and the name escapes me, um, Tahunga Canyon and Druffle. And Ruffle, uh, who's a, another pioneering UFO uh, researcher. Uh, so I don't know. I'll throw those out there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. some future thing. So I know there is another author working on, like, women in the UFO community. Oh, okay. So, All right. um, so I was actually going to reach out to her and be like, hey, I'm kind of working on something similar, and I wanted to include a couple UFO women. Um, right. Just kind of professional courtesy of, like, hey. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, so I do have a few more New Age yeah. women as well, um, especially with astrology. Like, I just happened to find some really interesting, like, women with astrology. Like, create, like oh, my gosh, what's her name? Um, created, like, the astrology charts. Oh, what's her name? Can't remember, um, which is why we need the book. Um, like, go. those yeah. little astrology scrolls that you get at the grocery store, like, she's the one behind yeah. that. Um, oh, wow. So... And ironically, a lot of the mediums, like this time around, the spiritualist mediums were kind of proven to be frauds, but the way that they went about it was so comical and yeah. really made, like, 
SPR and Ghost Club really have to step up their game with like Oops. how they debunked and how they researched. And I'm like, I got to put them in. Um, like Usapia Palladino, um, it kind of turned into this like almost wacky racist type of thing with her because she'd get debunked, but then she'd just keep going to another country and keep doing her thing. <laughs> and, and it was like this wacky racist thing where it's like, they're all tr- or like the Scooby Doo chase, like through all the doors. Right, like, she, yeah, yeah. like it's just I like I'm howling with laughter reading about her, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, she's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I also have a lot more cultists this time around. Like I didn't really yeah. expect that, but like Moynia Mathers, um, she's gonna be in there. Uh, Sybil Lee, Helen Duncan, um, they're in there. Uh, for at least I'm pretty sure for volume two, I do have a couple more modern ones, maybe a little bit more than last time. Um, including my mentor, she passed away last year and, um, I'm like, yeah, I got to include her. Cause she's kind of the reason, like one of the big reasons why I wanted to write the book. Cause I'm like, yeah. well, you know, and she did a lot for cryptozoology in Canada. So I'm well, like, I was, it's, it's legit. Yeah. I was just going to ask you that about cryptozoology. Cause that's definitely a field where you don't hear of any, prominent women almost exclusively uh, uh, yeah there's some contemporary women who are you know making a mark in the field and of course we talked about linda but when you sort of hear about the old timey i think it, i think there was like four dudes i don't know they had a nickname or something like the four horsemen of bigfootery or some shit mm-hmm. but it was like four guys that were like the the bigfoot uh people um but i uh, also just dawned on me too sherry steiger was pretty uh you know, Sherry, oh. Brad and Sherry, Brad and Sherry were, you know, they were kind of a team. So it's like, uh, but, but Brad always, you know, people always remember Brad Steiger, but if Brad were here right now, he, I'm sure he'd be insisting. He'd be like, that was all Sherry, man. That was, <laughs> so yeah. A, yeah. another person of, of great import. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I also have Claudia Ackley too. Um, she is an interesting one. She uh, sued the state of California for not willing to research Bigfoot. I thought that was interesting. Oh, like, eh. oh wow. I, yeah, right. I want to say her name was Claudia Ackley. Now, whether or not she really saw Bigfoot or not is um, uh, uh, whether that was a thing or not. Did she pass away recent, more recently? She did. She passed yeah, away thought, in 2023. I I hearing that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, hearing she, that. yeah, she passed very recently. Um who else would I include? Oh yeah, so this, so I'm kind of going over like there's going to be some more modern women this time around, and um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm looking so, forward to it. Yeah, as you can tell, you. I, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So we we talked about alexmatsua.com. That's where people can find where you're going to be speaking. You got you you, you got a book on for Northern Virginia. I think you said uh, mm-hmm. haunted stuff that's coming out later this year, probably um, yep. volume two. You hope to get it out. Anything else you want to plug here? Uh, you got a YouTube channel. You may have a podcast. I don't know. You're very prolific. I'm 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 very impressed with uh with your hustle in the in the world of the paranormal. So I'm I'm incredibly lazy. So <laughs> I I'm <laughs> very tired. <laughs> <laughs> I am very tired. Um, right. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, my website's the best place to go. Um, Like I said, I'm wrapping up a book about haunted Northern Virginia that will be out in hopefully September. Um. And then with Women of the Paranormal Volume 2, probably, hopefully, June uh, for Haunted America. And, um, yeah, I'm actually going to be diving into a non-paranormal book project with some uh, history writing. Uh, and then um, there's a couple of haunted locations that I frequent that want me to write a book about their their place. So I'm like, all right, that might be a – there might be some – Yeah. Yeah. Something there. All right. Something there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, Alex, I can't thank you enough. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, as you know, when I was emailing you yesterday, I was like, I cannot wait to talk about this book. Uh, I really, really, I really enjoyed it quite a bit. And and as I said, I learned so much. And, and that's really, I think the listeners could tell, like when I start out the show and I'm just ranting and raving and ready to go, they're like, oh, shit. But all has got something he wants to tell us here that he picked up from tonight's guest. Um, like, like the, uh, like how I could barely contain myself with Justin McHenry and the Lemuria book. That's how I felt um, tonight going into this conversation. Cause I'm like, I cannot wait to talk about all this amazing stuff that Alex mm-hmm. has 
has put in this book. It's really, really awesome. And uh, I, I, I can't put it over enough, folks. Go out and get it. It's on Amazon right now. Um, and you can find out more from Alex at alexmatsuo.com. And, and that's it. I, I have a feeling you're going to be back on But All of America. I hope if you'll, <laughs> if you'll, if you'll come back, I would love to have you back on the show, uh, you know, on multiple occasions. I really enjoy talking mm-hmm. to you and uh, you bring a real thoughtfulness to this, um, to this field that uh, is appreciated on this end of, uh, of the screen here uh, in this weird call. So <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much. much. Thanks for having me.